This is Ken Hans, best storyteller in Texas, and uh, uh, welcome to today's podcast. John Steinbeck said, uh, now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good. And uh, how many times in life do we have, especially young people, just trying to be perfect on everything? And uh, you don't have to be perfect. Just be good. And uh, don't worry about the other. And I, I think that's a good saying. Um, I'm in Lubbock today, and uh, they were working on the football stadium. They're doing some a lot of remodeling and uh, on the south end zone, and and uh, it'll be ready for the 2024 season. And there's a reminds me of two stories. Uh, one was at Rice, the last game of the year, and I believe in '51. They said Brown and Root construction would start on it, and they'd be having a new one by 52. So in July, uh, Jess Neely, the football coach at Rice, went out to look and see, you know, how, how it was going. And it really concerned him, and he got George Brown, one of the brothers of Brown and Root, and said, uh, look, I'm, I'm concerned we've you know our first game is going to be coming up and i'm concerned that you're not going to have this stadium ready and uh and george brown said well when is the first game now, that's an, a that's a bad sign that he's asking when that first game is you know you ought to know and uh, jess nearly said it's september 16th and george brown said is it a day or a night game uh, he he was going to have to have some additional time. Now that's kind of the conversation I had with Lee Lewis, uh, who did our, did our eastern side of the stadium in the Texas Tech Club. And Lee's a good contractor and hard worker and everything. And and uh, we, we almost had to go back. Is it a day or night game? But he finished it in time, and uh, Texas Tech kicked off the new stadium on the east side uh, to match the west side with uh, SMU, and uh, I remember the day was extremely hot, and they ran out of water, and uh, it was like, you know, the first Saturday in in September, and it was, you know, 98 degrees or something like that, and we had people that were water hydrants just filling people's bottles up, and a lot of people turned a bottle in. They didn't get the same bottle back, but they're so thirsty. <laughs> they grabbed their water and went on. I just thought to myself, oh, me, I hope there's no lawsuits come out of this. But I, I can tell it now because the statute of limitations is run, and you know, and so if, if you if you got some kind of hoof and mouth disease because of uh, getting bad water at that game, uh, it's 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 too late to complain. Uh, you, you know, I, I, some some of the lawyers that uh, they may be listening to podcasts, they may have a new ad on here today. If, if you were injured at Camp Lejeune or <laughs> at the Tech SMU game, uh, then uh, call this number. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I fully expect that the Camp Lejeune that that one got me. That you know, what what, what if I drove by? Well, yeah, well, call us anyway. Uh, you may be sick, and not know it, and. Uh, Ads uh, on TV, there's some real uh, unusual ads, and I've talked about it before. I, I, I still, one of my favorite was uh, uh, Long Arm of the Law and, and uh, The Strong Arm of the Law. And it showed us a guy uh, would be uh, arm wrestling. And I introduced a lawyer one time in Lubbock, and it was a very good, very prestigious lawyer. And I said, uh, I've always thought he's a great lawyer and great for somebody to use, but I found out that he can't arm wrestle, and so I, you know, I don't know why he still got a license. But some of them uh, are are pretty uh, comical to say the least. One of the things that uh, I wanted to talk today about something that's dawned on me this week. I, w- I went to get uh, some medicine. It was called in as a copay. Was two dollars and sixty cents. And, you know, you're always hearing that uh, somebody had insulin and uh, the insulin bill was came out, you know, two thousand dollars or whatever. And, you know, that's hard to believe. And there's always some extreme if there's a unusual situation, it makes a headline. So that makes a headline. I think they're getting that down. I do think that if if you got a two dollar and sixty cent, that's, you know, as a very reasonable as far as I was concerned. On uh, medicine, you, you 
just think back a hundred years ago and that people were dying of infections. Uh, You didn't have antibiotics. People were dying of heart disease. You didn't have cholesterol medicine. And just the medicines we have today, how it's extended the life of uh, our citizens. The life expectancy has, has been going up and continues to go up. In 1980, if you compared the United States with 11 other countries that were very wealthy, uh, France, Great Britain, Sweden, or di- different ones, the U.S. life expectancy kept going up from 1980 to 2014. But it was falling behind the other 11 countries during that period of time. It was uh, during that time there were in the U.S. was a lot larger. There were 500,000 uh, more people died in the U.S. than those other countries, and they were small and primarily wealthy countries. But we had the trend was not going in the direction that we needed. Also, in that time, if if you look back, the United States spent twelve thousand nine hundred and fourteen dollars in twenty fourteen on health care per person, twelve thousand nine hundred and fourteen, almost thirteen thousand dollars. The other comparable countries spent six thousand. US total in a year would spend three trillion dollars on uh, health care. Medicine makes up a very small part of it, but uh, all of it is important and and I do not see Congress coming up with an answer on that because it it is so controversial. It brings up things that people were going to repeal uh, on Obamacare and then didn't. Then you know that some they did. You can get your own doctor, and you don't. You know, you can always keep your doctor as everybody had been promised. And that, that there's been some adaptment uh, on that. I think that that. We have to keep in mind that 6000 per person in some of those other countries, they don't have choices that we have. And so if you have choices, it's going to cost more. We're opening more medical schools uh, nationwide. Uh, Texas has opened considerably more. Uh, University of Houston got a medical school. Uh, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley uh, has a medical school that's up and running now. I know here at Texas Tech, we have the medical school in Lubbock, but uh, we have also the third and fourth year students in Midland, Odessa, and in Amarillo. And then the Health Science Center in El Paso has their own medical school. But as as we produce more doctors, we find that uh, it it's still a long wait to get a doctor. If you want to go to the doctor, it's, it, you know, you can go to the doc in the box and walk in and and get treated and for emergency care or any anything you've got. But if you have to go to a specialist, goodness, sometimes it uh, can be weeks and months before you do so, and that makes it tough. In 91, 1991, 80% of all the uh, pharmaceutical research was done by universities. By 2004, some 13 years later, it was only 26%. It had gone from 80% down to 26 The other 74% was done by uh, for-profit research groups. About the time, uh, there was a cutback on research at major universities, and that uh, they were still wanting to do additional research, and they were using for-profit companies. Uh, a university is going to be more apt to tell you if something works or won't work because they'll have other funds that they may get as far as their research is concerned. But that is one thing that has drastically changed as uh, the budget deficits got higher, the, the research by universities went down. You know, I think one of the things you always have to do on independent peer review is the most important thing in in research pharmaceutical drugs and that uh, that should be a top priority the general public you have to depend on that research to know you're making the right decision uh, when you're taking some uh, 
uh, medicine. I, you know, I see the ads on time. They, they have ads for things, uh, ads uh, of medicines I've never heard of and diseases I've never heard of. And they always have that disclaimer, and the ads are about 30 seconds, and they're about ad part of that 30 seconds is about 12 to 15 seconds, and the rest of the ad is about, you know, if it kills you overnight, uh, we're not liable. <laughs> I mean, they have the, you know, it kind of, it kind of scares me uh, when I listen to it that uh, as they make sure that, that they're not liable. It is a big business in the future. I think that more research done by universities on pharmaceutical drugs, better off you're going to be both the uh, manufacturers and, and as well as the patients. But I do say this, look, you have to count your blessings, and there are a lot of diseases, a lot of problems people have in health care that uh, are solved because of, uh, of a drug that's been invented. The price... In 2008, the price of a new drug coming on uh, was $2,000 per new drug, and that was the cost uh, of the research and everything. By 2021, it was up to 180000 So it, it, it dramatically increased. In research, it, you know, because of lawsuits and all kinds of things, uh, you've really got to be on top of it and make sure you cover all your bases on doing research on any type of drugs and that you need some time, and, and it takes time to do it and do it right. Another issue that's been big and that everybody talks about is climate change, and, and there's always been climate change. Everybody talks about how bad it is and and that uh, there, there was a couple members of Congress said that, you know, everybody's going to die by you know, 2030. And so, I mean, that just gives me, you know, uh, seven more years. So, you know, I, I, I may, I'll try to be real careful. Uh, everyone do likewise. If you go back in climate deaths, deaths caused by drought, drowning, floods, anything related, related to climate, in 1920, there were 500,000 people died because of things that happen in the climate, floods, drought, whatever. In 2010, it was 18,000. Went from 500,000 to 18,000. In 2022, it was 11,000. So the actual number of people that are dying because something happened in the climate has dropped tremendously. And that's because we adapt. Uh, we adapt. Our governments adapt. We don't build in, in flood-prone areas as much. Uh, we make adjustments. And I think that when people see a problem, sometimes they overstate that problem, not realizing or not taking into consideration that people are going to make adjustments. Uh, when there are a certain number of deaths in certain areas, people are going to make adjustments. In 1901, uh, a lot of people thought we were running out of oil and that we didn't have any oil. And, and then spindle tot hit during uh, uh, drilling down in Beaumont area. And it spewed oil all over the place in southeast Texas. And, and people, you know, they started drilling oil wells. And you get into even other parts of east Texas in Kilgore, Longview, Marshall, all through there. And there were some people in Kilgore bought uh, burial plots. And, uh, you know, they said they had a big family and they're going to have to have 30 people buried there. And they could, you know, they'd have 30 plots and they'd drill an oil well on it. And there wasn't a regulation. They didn't, you know, Railroad Commission has regulation now. You have have 40 acres or you, you can get adjustments on that. But uh, they were drilling oil wells in cemeteries. And uh, the oil price kept going down because people would come in and, they, they couldn't sell their oil, uh, that there wasn't a truck to pick it up that day. And, and so if a truck comes by the next day, you better be prepared to sell the oil. The result was they drove a price of oil down to a dime a barrel. And that's when the legislature and the governor came up with the idea to have the Railroad Commission, which regulated natural gas, have them regulate oil drilling and uh, not waste their natural resources. 
and the Supreme Court had ruled that you could regulate something and trying to make sure you did not waste the natural resources. And the, they had a bill introduced in the House that passed by one vote, and a bunch of the independent oil operators who got the best deal out of the whole thing, uh, they were celebrating that night at some bar in uh, Austin, and one of the state representatives that uh, voted for the bill came in there, and they kind of got into a discussion, and and uh, the state representative got beat up pretty good, and uh, he got whipped around. Legislature was mad about it, and they moved to reconsider their vote the next day, and they passed it. And instead of it failing, it passed in the Senate. The result of that was establishing the Railroad Commission as really the OPEC uh, for the world at the time, they determined how much was going to be produced. And uh, by doing that, they had pretty well controlled uh, the flow and, and as a result, the market and things stabilized. And it was a step in the right direction. But it was a controversial thing, to, to say the least. The Railroad Commission would give you a certain number of days, and I, I call it the allowable. They would allow you to pump your oil well 20 days in a month, 20 out of 30, maybe 28. And uh, if there's an overabundant supply and they were wasting resources, might not give you five days or eight days. And it stabilized prices. And then OPEC came in, and, uh, and they, in the 60s and 70s, in the 70s, 73, uh, they put an embargo on. And so it, it completely... Uh, turn things upside down and for those of you old enough to, to remember that when the oil embargo came on the price of gasoline jumped way up there look there there's going to be adjustments that people will make those adjustments will be determined by supply and demand in most and if not all cases and so the alarmists the sensationalists that say that you got to do something today and and this is what is happening uh the the country and the world they make adjustments as we move forward and and we always have in the past and i think they will continue to do so when you make adjustments you've got to look at them uh in short term and long term and see what will work and what won't work everybody's going to electric cars now that's a big push you know what are you going to do about batteries what are you gonna, there's just a lot of questions out there and that over the next five years there'll be a lot of answers the innovation in this country in western civilization has been remarkable because people make adjustments when there is a demand well, Ken Ants, best storyteller in Texas. I appreciate you listening. John Steinbeck said, now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good. I like that. <laughs>